yeah, and we're going to have another great set of talks here. We're going to have more juice. The juice will flow. And it is going to be a good time. Reminder that we got the speaker um, kind of notes up in the theater. We, If you're watching this on Twitch or YouTube or anything like that, you can still get a ticket on Eventbrite for the very end of the conference and come to our social space. And if you're running into problems, remember, you can always try refreshing the page. This is custom made software ourselves. And I'll also shout out Steam sale ends on Monday. Merch ends on the 23rd. Get all of your stuff. We are heading into the end of the weekend, sad as that is. So <clears throat> hitting you with those last minute reminders. And if you have space feedback, maybe try and take a moment to leave that in the central hall at some point today. We really appreciate it. It helps us build out a better kind of set of um, social space choices for next year. I know we've tried some new things like the breakout rooms. We've tried some new things with the embedded video chat, which we know has had some drawbacks, but it would be great to know what people think of it. So if you get a chance, we really appreciate that. It helps us make the space even better. And yeah, all kinds of fun note walls too. We'll be doing our best to share those in some form after the conference through uh, Twitter and our mailing list. So just keep out an eye for that along with all the notes in the Space Hangar Lounge. I know people are excited. We've been retweeting stuff like slides from our speakers as it comes up, but we will have a big dump of those at the end of the conference along with all of our videos on YouTube. So without further ado, waiting so patiently, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Chris McCormick, who's here to talk about our favorite topic of roguelike celebration 2021, juice. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry for the uh, darkness of my camera. I forgot that uh, the sun would not be up yet. And normally this room is lit by the sun. So um, <clears throat> it is a little bit dark. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I'm here to talk about uh, building juicy minimal roguelikes in the browser. Um, by the end of this talk, I hope to have equipped your mental inventory with the tools to start your own browser-based roguelike development adventure. Um, so what do I mean by juicy and what do I mean by minimal in the context of roguelike games? Um, so let's talk about minimal roguelikes first. What does it mean to be minimal? For me, it means building a game with the barest essential gameplay elements. They're turn-based, they're permadeath, entities in the game have various attributes. You walk around to collect things and you fight baddies. As you use things and fight baddies, mathematical attributes are updated. Interesting worlds arise as a result of the interaction of those various attributes. So, I mean, that's pretty much a description of a minimal roguelike. Because <coughs> uh, roguelikes have become these deep games with lots of emergent complexity. I'm sure you know of the uh, uh, many of the games that people are playing these days with these high levels of complexity, big complicated worlds. Um, I grew up playing NetHack and later the original Rogue. Um, and I remember discovering Rogue after NetHack and finding it really refreshing. For me, Rogue represents minimalist perfection. There's enough going on that it doesn't get boring, but it leaves plenty of space for the player to make up their own narrative. <clears throat> I wrote my first game on the Apple IIe at eight years old. It was a turn-based game where you control the letter X and try not to get caught by the letter O. You can see that on the screen at the moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is basically an extremely minimal roguelike I think it's a, an example of going too minimal to really call it a roguelike. So that's what I mean by minimal here. In the context of video games, juicy means the same thing as game feel. It's a combination of sound and animation that happens in response to some input that makes the game feel alive. Screen shake is an example of juice. This is an example of screen shake from a demo called um, Chicken Sword. Notice how the screen literally shakes as the character lands on the ground. This demo is by game developer Ulon displays a ton of juice. So notice the dust trail as the character moves, the movement of the grass, the movement of the lamp as the player donks against it, the muzzle flash, the way the character is pushed back when they're firing, the yellow ball of the shot, and the smoke which results as the shot expires. So that's uh, seven different elements of juice that, I, that you can see at once. All of this together adds a great deal of feeling to the game. So that's what I mean by minimal, juicy roguelikes. The gameplay is minimal, and they're graphically rich. <clears throat> the web browser is a perfect environment for making these types of games, because the web browser has batteries included. I'm going to show you how you show you the games I've made with browser text, 
to give you an idea of what, what you can do. <clears throat> asteroid was my first solo developed commercial game. In it, you discover a hollow asteroid filled with procedural mines, facilities, alien creatures, and space loot. The gameplay is minimal. It's a smaller and simpler game even than Rogue, but it's graphically richer. In this GIF, you can see some of the juice I was talking about with Screen Shake, uh, Monster Ghost, Hit Point Indicator, and when you collect an item, it pops off the top of the screen. I made this in a high-intensity one-and-a-half-month development spurt in 2020. I built it for the browser and ported it to Android and Windows. This was basically as a result of having always wanted to make this game and finally saying, if I don't do it now, I never will. I'm currently in the process of updating Asteroid and porting it to Apple devices. My latest game is Smallest Quest. The gameplay is even more minimal than Asteroid. I noticed my kids really love turn-based play and I wanted to make a game that appeals to kids. <clears throat> you collect items such as, uh, you collect the items as cards, um, which is directly inspired by the game Patient Rogue. Um, in this game, I wanted to explore the idea of quests or missions. So the gameplay is roguelike with missions. It's a short game with gamepad play and simple graphics. I hand drew all of the sprites, which was a lot of fun. In the end, my kids gave it a thumbs up, so that's a win. So that's enough about my games. Um, <clears throat> why use the browser as the runtime for your game? So you can find a browser on pretty much every modern computer. It's completely, it's a completely ubiquitous runtime environment. Um, developing for browsers is fast. There's no compilation step, and with modern live reloading technology, you can see changes as soon as you make them. Browsers support different types of graphics out of the box, plain images, SVGs, and even OpenGL 3D uh, rendering through WebGL. Browsers have excellent support for different typefaces. Rendering text is as easy as changing an HTML tag. There is built-in support for touch um, and mouse events if you need them. Uh, CSS animations let you add all kinds of movement, and that's what I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, live object inspection using the developer console means you can modify data structures in real time. Uh, and finally, developing... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. I seem to have a cold. Developing for the browser makes your code highly portable. As long as there is a browser on a given platform, your game will run there. And uh, it's also easier to reach players for that reason, because everybody has a browser. Now I'm going to show you how you can copy and paste together about 200 lines of code to make a basic functioning browser-based roguelike. Uh, it's not a complete game, but it's enough for you to build something great off. Um, all you need is a web browser and internet access, so you can get hold of Rock.js. Rock.js, short for Roguelike Toolkit in JavaScript, is an excellent roguelike development library by Andre Zara. I hope I pronounced his name right. You can use Rock.js with JavaScript, TypeScript, ClojureScript, or any other front-end browser language. Um, it takes care of console rendering, uh, random number generator, pathfinding, field of view, map generation, <coughs> keyboard input, tile maps, scheduling, and has support for hex tiles. So the only thing you need to do to start using it is put a single script tag into your HTML file. <coughs> Andre has a great introductory tutorial on Rogue Basin and a couple of very useful JS Fiddle demos. I've made this uh, GitHub repository with links to all of that so, uh, so that you can find it after my talk, and I'll uh, post that in the chat as well. Um, but basically, it's at github.com, and my username is chr15m, and then the repository is called Roguelike Celebration 2021 with hyphens. It also has uh, an HTML script tag for loading the Rod.js library right here. <coughs> so I said we only need a browser, but usually you need a text editor to write code. Um, Luckily, these days, there are a number of IDs uh, that run inside the browser, so you don't even need a text editor to get started. I made a browser-based text editor myself uh, specifically for making web apps, which you can find at slingcode.net. So I'm going to pull it up now to, um, whoops, where did my, I'm going to pull it up now and use it to create our first uh, browser-based roguelike. So all we're going to do is take Andre's tutorial code from JS Fiddle. So here, uh, in, the, in this uh, repository that I've shared, there's a few links here. There's a Rod.js tutorial on Rogue Basin, which if you want to do it from scratch yourself, that's a good place to start. It's got three parts, and uh, you can do it quite quickly. But there's also, Andre's made this uh, JS fiddle with the result of doing the tutorial, so it's sort of like the full demo game. 
So <clears throat> I'm actually going to go in here and just copy that code. And uh, I'm going to, in Sling code, I'm going to create a new. So this is basically a online app editor. And you just get this index.html file when you first start. <clears throat> so I'm going to paste Andre's code in here. And um, so it's, it's only about 100 lines long. And uh, I've just pasted it into the script portion of the index.html file. So now the other thing I need is the actual script tag so that it loads rot.js from web. So I'm going to go back to my GitHub here, and I'm going to copy that one and go in here, and I'm going to say paste that one in. So now when I save that and run it, I should get Andre's game in the tab here. Yeah, so this is uh, <clears throat> this is Andre's nice little demo game. Um, basically, you run around looking for your lost banana and avoiding a monster character called Pedro, represented by the P character. So you can move and press Enter, and it has a pop-up which says if the box is empty or if you found the banana. And oh, I just won. Okay, so yep. And uh, so it's quite simple, but it features you know many of the things you'll need like keyboard input, etc. So I'm actually just going to remove this hello world tag here so that we just have the game. So I've got an empty body tag, and Rod.js inserts itself into that empty body tag. <coughs> so this is a great start if you want a console game. Um, you can dive right in and just start tweaking that. Um, and as I said, you can just use a simple text editor and load it up in your browser. Um, and you only need one file, that's index.html with this code. And you could start tinkering with the uh, different properties of this little mini demo and start building out your own roguelike. So in the GitHub readme, you'll also find another link uh, to another demo by Andre showing how to integrate tile map graphics. Um, so that's the second link here, Rod.js tile map example. <coughs> now, this one is even shorter. It's only 29 lines. And all that's happening here is he's creating a simple uh, digger map and rendering it with these tile graphics um, with this nice little four-character uh, four tile set. So I'm going to take that, basically, this exact code and paste it in. But I'm actually going to use a, a different tile map. Um, so I'm going to use the Kenny.nl. I don't know if you know of Kenny.nl, but he might have this great, um, this great a uh, tile map called Micro Rogue. Um, and I've just ex enlarged it here to five pixels by five pixels. Um, and so, and I've indexed. So with Rot.js, basically you index into the tile map and you give each character a name. So this is my main character I'm going to use. Here's a little chest. Uh, this is a floor tile. <clears throat> and I'm just going to grab this code from, uh, so I'm going to grab this code from the GitHub which uh, basically sets up the tile map. I'm just going to paste that in as well. So as you can see, just a few lines of code there. That's loading the tile map.png, this file here. And then you've got the actual tile map. So the add character is mapped to 4,0. The dot character is mapped to 4,4, 4, et cetera. Uh, and then there's a couple of things I need to do to hook it up. So this rot.display, I need to pass it in there. So rot.js sets up the display here. And um, I'm just going to tell it, instead of using a console-based display, I want you to use these options above here, which uh, is the tile map. And then finally, in the digger, so the map, the map generator itself, I'm going to tell it to use the width and height of the, uh, the same as what I've specified <coughs> in the options here. Um, and finally, I need to add this bit, which is um, saying, when wait for the tile map to load before you actually trigger the initialization of the game. So I'm going to replace this last line here, game.init, with waiting for the tile set to load. And if I save that, yeah, so we get the same demo load up, except now it has the, uh, the tile set integrated. <coughs> and again, I can just move around, pressing Enter to check the boxes. And Pedro is now represented by this little zombie graphic. Um, and yeah, so it's the same basic game as before, except it has a tile, tile map. Um, 
Yeah, so, uh, okay. So you can see straight away that getting a mini graphical roguelike going is fairly trivial in HTML and JavaScript. A single HTML file, a few, couple hundred lines long. I'm gonna show you some other cool features of using the web browser now. Um, the first one is fonts and text rendering in general. So let's say we wanna add some text-based UI to our game and display the number of hit points. We can, because it's the browser, we can easily overlay text in whatever font we like on top of the game uh, using, just simply using an HTML tag. So we'll put a P tag, um, which is a paragraph tag into this file. Um, and I'll go in here because I've, here's one I made earlier. I'll copy that and paste that into the body here. So what this will do, it should add the text hit points five at the top of the screen here. <clears throat> so I hit save. <coughs> And that's what I get. I get hit points five at the top. Now you could change this uh, body tag and change your code so that that's updated in real time, you know, uh, procedurally um, specifying the number and updating it when it changes. But I'm just, just for the sake of display, I'm just gonna keep it static. Um, and so the other thing we need to do is add, so like basically at the moment, this looks pretty terrible. It's just a simple uh, Times New Roman font. Um, so what we can do is go over to Google Web Fonts and find a better font. And then when you uh, select it here, when you say, I want to use this style, you get the include here. And then we can just dump that into our HTML to start using that font. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm, the final thing you have to do is just include this stuff. So in the body tag. So up in my CSS here. I will add that into the body tag. And if I save that, I get this uh, rendered in the nice pixel font from um, Google Web Fonts. So as you can see, this kind of iteration is very fast, you know, um, updating the fonts and things like that. Now, um, I can I can also put styles. I'll just add these styles quickly for, so this, to lay it out a bit nicer. So what that does is, it's saying put this absolutely on the page. So at the moment it's at top 36 pixels, but I can move it to the bottom quite easily. <coughs> and that's gone down there, down the bottom. <coughs> but that's, a, as you can see, it makes laying it out quite easily, quite easy. Um, and you can do that with any kinds of overlaid stuff. So the cards in Smallest Quest, the demo I showed you before, I've uh, done like that. And uh, Rot.js itself also has support for different fonts when doing the console-based rendering that I showed you in the first part. So rather than overlaying, it does it uh, inside it. So another thing, I'm running out of time, but SVGs are pretty cool. I used SVGs a lot in Astrog, um, and they scale smoothly. Uh, and they're built into the browser as well. So by default, Rot.js renders everything into a single canvas element. Um, if I inspect the element, uh, you can see this pretty clearly. So I'm gonna say inspect and you can see here the canvas element, and there's my element I added before. They're two separate things, but the entire game is currently being rendered into this one canvas, which works kind of like a giant image. Um, if we want to use some of the cool built-in features of the web browser, we need to overlay some HTML elements onto our game. So what I want to do is build an overlay on top of this character here so that I can um, so that I can see that, you know, so that I can make it interactive, basically. Uh, so to do that, what I'm going to do is... Um, Got some more code here in the, on the GitHub that can be copy pasted. Um, but so basically, I'm just going to add a box with a div tag to my demo here. So underneath the hit points, we're going to add another box. And I can place that box on the screen. And now, what I, what I want to do is actually. <clears throat> so you won't be able to see the box when I first save it but I'll add a little size, so with maybe 42 pixels, height 42 pixels. And now you can see that box right there, so the little red box, but we actually want this to overlay on top of the player character so that it's useful. Um, and again, on the GitHub, there's a little bit of code here which does that. So I, I won't explain all of it, but basically in the players on update function, what we wanna do is move the box so that it overlays on top of the canvas over the player so we can then use that <clears throat> so I'm going to take that bit of code and I'm going to go down here to player dot um, draw. So when it updates where the, the player's position is on the screen, we also want it to update the box. So I'll paste that in here. 
And when I save that, we now see that the red box is overlaid on top of the player. So that's pretty cool. As the player moves around, we've got this little, and if you inspect this in the browser, in the console, you can see that it's actually separate to the canvas. So the canvas is underneath and the div is on top. Um, and we can use that. So what, what can we do with this box once it's overlaid? We can add juice like um, sparkles or dust effects or bounce. Um, we can actually even render this character straight into the box instead of onto the canvas. So we have a sprite layer as well. And that means that you can, so in Smallest Quest, I used that technique and you could use, move the character independently. Um, and then let's try one more thing, which is adding a click handler. So when you click on this box, or so anytime you click on the character, you'll see something. Uh, that's a very simple little piece of code here, which is um, you just say box.onDraw, uh, sorry, box.onClick. So we've got this little onClick handler. So box.onClick equals function. And then we're just going to alert, change that so that it says, I am the player. So now if we, <coughs> if we move the player around, when we click on the player, we should see an alert that says, I am the player. So yeah, as you can see, you can add uh, overlay elements quite easily. Um, so in both of my games, I use this trick of placing HTML elements over the canvas to accomplish various things. I'm gonna bring up my latest game, Smallest Quest now, so I could show you this. I took this idea one step further in Smallest Quest. I used Rot.js to draw all the backgrounds, um, uh, but I drew the characters and items inside floating divs on top of the, on top of the game. So the characters and items here are all um, drawn as those floating divs. Um, so, and all the juice you can see here is uh, done with style sheet animation. So this bobbing item and the way the players jump and uh, when you, when, during combat, you uh, get these little overlays which show that, <clears throat> so the sword swipe, that's also done in the, with the same technique. And uh, one pretty cool thing um, is you can inspect this object in real time so um, if I bring that one up, you can see that it's bobbing there and you can actually select the element. Um, and finally, I added this, uh, so yeah, I'll just quickly show you, this is the code for doing the CSS animation. I'm running out of time, so I won't talk you through this, but basically you just add a class to each item and then you can uh, animate it with a CSS animation. And you can see this is very short and declarative. Um, so it's very quick to add this type of, um, Juice. So finally, I want to show you a cool trick that you can use because um, you can bind data and event handlers to on-screen elements. So you can do some pretty nifty things. Uh, in the smallest quest code base, I have an event handler on each item and monster, which logs the property of the thing to the console. So what's cool about that is you can edit it in real time. So let's say this piece of food here, I'm doing some game balance and I want to make it, oops, I ate it. I'll drop it again. So I've, I'll click that one. And now if I go to the console, uh, hopefully you can read this, but you can see here it's got item clicked and then it's got the properties of the item actually dumped. And what I can do is change the properties of that item. So this one's got food of five, um, which I could change it so it's sort of like food of 10. And then when I collect that item, it'll actually have 10 food. Um, it's more interesting if you do it with a monster or a... Um, so I can make this, I'll chase this bat over here, and I can make this bat into a super bat um, by, so here I should have a monster clicked, and I can go in here and I can change his damage to be 20. So now if this bat hits me, that's it, I'm toast. Yeah, one hit and it got me. So as you can see, um, what's cool about that is you can, uh, you can do game balance in real time. Um, so the final advantage I want to talk about is portability. First of all, if you target the browser, anyone can run your game, but also there's a bunch of projects which let you run web-based things in weird places. So for Astrog, I used the Apache Cordova framework to make native Android builds of my game. This was fairly trivial to get working, maybe one day of work. Um, basically all it does is wrap up a web view as a native app. So the code I'm using in the browser for debugging is exactly the same as the code um, I'm using on the phone. For the desktop ports of both Astrog and Smallest Quest, I use Electron, um, which also give you access to the developer console and let you do live tweaking. 
Um, yeah, so that's my talk. Uh, I hope it's given you some ideas about how you can use the web browser to make your next roguelike game in JavaScript. Um, by the way, I'm releasing the graphical tiles from Smallest Quest as a standalone free tile set called Doodle Rogue. That should be up on chr15m.itch.io, which is my personal itch page. <coughs> and I'll also announce that um, on the Roguelike Dev Reddit when I, uh, when I finally get that up. Um, finally, you can find me on Twitter, and my personal site is mccormick.cx. Uh, the bottom link is Punk Collective there. Um, that's me and some other friends who are releasing one game a month. If you're interested in finding out about our releases, there's an email sign up at the bottom of thepunkcollective.com. So thanks very much for having me. It's a real honor to talk at Roguelike Celebration. And just quickly, I will post that link to the GitHub with all of these resources uh, into the chat afterwards. I believe there's a, a room which I'll go to. So if you have any questions, um, hit me up. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, and we have time for a few questions and we've been getting some posted. The first one, I think pretty straightforward. Where can we get the Chicken Sword game? <laughs> I don't actually know. Uh, it's <laughs> I just found a GIF, you know, doing an image search. Um, but yeah, that did look very cool. Okay, I think someone, it's actually... Someone will have to hunt I think it's just a GIF. Okay, okay. All right. Well, bad news, everyone. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, here's another, I think, a, a solid question from Foxtel David. How do you handle with, I mean, just generally, like these types of browser games, making it responsive at different browser sizes? Yeah, so I had to wrestle with that quite a bit. I have a project which is a um, roguelike boilerplate for the browser, which is like pretty much this demo, but a bit more advanced. And it does it does that. So basically, my technique is just center it on the screen. Um, and if you're on mobile, shrink it down a little bit because people are used to seeing smaller interfaces. So you can fit, so you can fit less on the screen, but you make it smaller, basically. If that makes sense, um, right. yeah. So I would, uh, that's how I would do it, just centering on the screen, and by that I mean centering the character at the center of the screen. And uh, the way I did that was with a CSS translate um, transform. So you you can pick up the character position of the canvas and then just shift the whole thing on the screen to the middle. Right, cool, that's fun. <laughs> uh, another question from Hypergardens, how would you advise someone host their game on GitHub pages or is there something else particularly handy? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it depends what you, what, what you want to accomplish, but uh, I know itch.io has a built-in HTML hosting, so you can just upload a zip file with your index.html and it'll unpack and people can play it right on the page. Um, and yeah, so the, the other way would be GitHub static hosting. And there are a ton of other static hosts now, like um, Netlify and I um, can't remember any of the other ones. But yeah, there's quite a lot of different techniques. My own, my, I, I host my stuff on a VPS um, using a deployment platform called Piku, which is like a self-hosted platform as a service. Cool. All right. Um, another question here from Hypergardens. Can you do text effects with a CSS animation? Yes, you can. You can do some pretty cool stuff, um, like uh, a glow effect you could do. So the text has a drop shadow, but you can make it look like a glow, and then you can have it like kind of pulsating, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of different things you can experiment with there. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, just looking through some of the other questions here. That's an interesting one from Sardonic. Um, can't users cycle through div elements using tab? And is that a problem for stuff like the, I, I assume like the clickable, like the character div and stuff like that, or does it end up working nicely? Uh, does so that not come up. Yeah, I think, so just, I think he means when you press tab, so on a form or something like that, you get the different elements selected. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work. And yeah, you would have to be careful if you want to not let people edit the game in real time, you'd have to <laughs> figure out a way of disenabling that. Yeah. <coughs> cool, that's a good question. Um, yeah, and I mean, Kate points out that tab-based navigation can be really great for accessibility. So there might be some interesting stuff there. If you already have a div for something like a player that normally would be a click, then being able to also support tab over and hit enter. Yep. And also, I mean, yeah, it, you can make it just completely keyboard driven like a, like any other roguelike. So, um, you know, have eye for the inventory and uh, then bind keys to 
using things from the inventory, et cetera. Right. Cool. Um, one other question, which is kind of about the balance between juice and innovative gameplay. I mean, I think we want both, but <laughs> yeah, uh, kind of, I guess, if you have any tips or how you feel about approaching some of those balances of, I guess, time you put in. Yeah. So, I mean, my thing is, you know, like most people, I'm very time constrained. So, and I, I have other projects I want to work on. So I try and I'm constrained in making my games very minimal, but I think it would be cool. It would be very interesting to see a game that has a lot more depth um, with also some juice. So, you know, taking one of the classics, classic roguelikes we all know and love and, uh, you know, really juicing it up and making it um, more exciting to play. <laughs> I like that. I like the thought of we get, you know, a juicy net hack fork, <laughs> mm. juice hack. Yeah, that would be cool. I think that's not something I would love to see an extremely juicy version of NetHack. It's open source, you know, fork it. Yeah. It. So, I mean, I thought about doing this a while back, but then I, you know, you'd have to, because NetHack is C, you'd have to find a way to compile it with WASM. And there are ways to do that, to bring it into the browser. Otherwise you could, you know, do some kind of, I think there's might be OpenGL renderers for NetHack on the back end, doing right. it all, all client side. But I, yeah, that's kind of like, not something that I have tinkered with very much. <laughs> but yeah. that's a cool idea. Yeah, I wonder you might be better off picking something like DCSS that's already got quite a lot of nice tile set web based things, but mm. yeah, the interesting Yeah. Part. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, just spitballing. I'm just excited. Oh, and it looks like someone <laughs> in, in chats uh, shared a link to get Angband in WASM. So, oh, yeah. Juicy Angband. Yeah, that would be super cool. That's good too. I would love to see that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, maybe we'll see it next year. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for all this. I hope that we end up seeing some more juicy games on the browser. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, absolutely.